Section 47 of Gray's Anatomy, Part 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Steve Foreman. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 1, by Henry Gray. The Patella. The patella is a flat, triangular bone situated on the front of the knee joint. It is usually regarded as a sesamoid bone, developed in the tendon of the quadriceps femoris, and resembles these bones, one, in being developed in a tendon, two, in its center of ossification presenting a knotty or tuberculated outline, three, in being composed mainly of dense cancellous tissue. It serves to protect the front of the joint and increases the leverage of the quadriceps femoris by making it act at a greater angle. It has an anterior and a posterior surface, three borders, and an apex. Surfaces The anterior surface is convex, perforated by small apertures for a passage of nutrient vessels and marked by numerous rough longitudinal striae. This surface is covered, in the recent state, by an expansion from the tendon of the quadriceps femoris, which is continuous below with the superficial fibers of the ligamentum patella. It is separated from the integument by a bursa. The posterior surface presents above a smooth oval articular area divided into two facets by a vertical ridge. The ridge corresponds to the groove on the patellar surface of the femur and the facets to the medial and lateral parts of the same surface. The lateral facet is the broader and deeper. Below the articular surface is a rough, convex, non-articular area, the lower half of which gives attachment to the ligamentum patellae. The upper half is separated from the head of the tibia by adipose tissue. Borders The base or superior border is thick and sloped from behind, downward, and forward. It gives attachment to that portion of the quadriceps femoris which is derived from the rectus femoris and vastus intermedius. The medial and lateral borders are thinner and converge below. They give attachment to those portions of the quadriceps femoris which are derived from the vasti lateralis and medialis. Apex. The apex is pointed and gives attachment to the ligamentum patella. Structure. The patella consists of nearly uniform, dense cancellous tissue covered by a thin, compact lamina. The cancellae immediately beneath the anterior surface are arranged parallel with it. In the rest of the bone, they radiate from the articular surface toward the other parts of the bone. Ossification The patella is ossified from a single center, which usually makes its appearance in the second or third year but may be delayed until the sixth year. More rarely, the bone is developed by two centers placed side by side. Ossification is completed about the age of puberty. Articulation. The patella articulates with the femur. The tibia. The tibia is situated at the medial side of the leg and excepting the femur is the longest bone of the skeleton. It is prismoid in form expanded above where it enters into the knee joint contracted in the lower third and again enlarged but to a lesser extent below in the male its direction is vertical and parallel with the bone of the opposite side but in the female it has a slightly oblique direction downward and lateralward to compensate for the greater obliquity of the femur it has a body in two extremities the upper extremity the upper extremity is large and expanded into two eminences, the medial and lateral condyles. The superior articular surface presents two smooth articular facets. The medial facet, oval in shape, is slightly concave from side to side and from before backward. The lateral, nearly circular, is concave from side to side but slightly convex from before backward especially at its posterior part, where it is prolonged onto the posterior surface for a short distance. The central portions of these facets articulate with the condyles of the femur, 
while their peripheral portions support the menisci of the knee joint, which here intervene between the two bones. Between the articular facets, but nearer the posterior than the anterior aspect of the bone, is the intercondyloid eminence, or spine of tibia, surmounted by, on either side by a prominent tubercle on to the sides of which the articular facets are prolonged. In front of and behind the intercondylar eminence are rough depressions for the attachment of the anterior and posterior cruciate ligaments and the menisci. The anterior surfaces of the condyle are continuous with one another, forming a large, somewhat flattened area. This area is triangular, broad above, and perforated by large vascular foramina, narrow below where it ends in a large oblong elevation, the tuberosity of the tibia, which gives attachment to the ligamentous patella. A bursa intervenes between the deep surface of the ligament and the part of the bone immediately above the tuberosity. Posteriorly, the condyles are separated from each other by a shallow depression, the posterior intercondylar fossa, which gives attachment to part of the posterior cruciate ligament of the knee joint. The medial condyle presents posteriorly a deep transverse groove for the insertion of the tendon of the semimembranosus. Its medial surface is convex, rough, and prominent. It gives attachment to the tibial collateral ligament. The lateral condyle presents posteriorly a flat articular facet, nearly circular in form, directed downward, backward, and lateralward for articulation with the head of the fibula. Its lateral surface is convex, rough, and prominent in front. On it is an eminence situated on a level with the upper border of the tuberosity and at the junction of its anterior and lateral surfaces for the attachment of the iliotibial band. Just below this is a part of the extensor digitorum longus takes off and a slip from the tendon of the biceps femoris is inserted. The body or shaft. The body has three borders and three surfaces. Borders. The anterior crest or border, the most prominent of the three, commences above at the tuberosity and ends below at the anterior margin of the medial malleolus. It's sinuous and prominent in the upper two-thirds of its extent, but smooth and rounded below. It gives attachment to the deep fascia of the leg. The medial border is smooth and rounded above and below, but more prominent in the center. It begins at the back part of the medial condyle and ends at the posterior border of the medial malleolus. Its upper part gives attachment to the tibial collateral ligament of the knee joint to the extent of about 5 centimeters, and insertion to some fibers of the popliteus from the middle third of some fibers of the soleus and flexor digitorum longus take origin. The interosseous crest or lateral border is thin and prominent, especially its central part, and gives attachment to the interosseous membrane. It commences above in front of the fibular articular facet and bifurcates below to form the boundaries of a triangular rough surface for the attachment of the interosseous ligament connecting the tibia and fibula. Surfaces The medial surface is smooth, convex, and broader above than below. Its upper third, directed forward and medialward, is covered by the aponeurosis derived from the tendon of the sartorius and by the tendons of the gracilis and semitendinosus, all of which are inserted nearly as far forward as the anterior crest. In the rest of its extent it is subcutaneous. The lateral surface is narrower than the medial. Its upper two-thirds present a shallow groove for the origin of the tibialis anterior its lower third is smooth, convex, curves gradually forward to the anterior aspect of the bone, and is covered by the tendons of the tibialis anterior, extensor hallucis longus, and the extensor digitorum longus, arranged in this order from the medial side. The posterior surface presents, at its upper part, a prominent ridge, the popliteal line, 
which extends obliquely downward from the back part of the articular facet for the fibula to the medial border. At the junction of its upper and middle thirds, it marks the lower limit of the insertion of the popliteus, serves for the attachment of the fascia covering this muscle, and gives origin to part of the soleus, flexor digitorum longus, and tibialis posterior. The triangular area, above this line, gives insertion to the popliteus. The middle third of the posterior surface is divided by a vertical ridge into two parts. The ridge begins at the popliteal line and is well marked above, but indistinct below. The medial and broader portion gives origin to the flexor digitorum longus, the lateral and narrower to part of the tibialis posterior. The remaining part of the posterior surface is smooth and covered by the tibialis posterior, flexor digitorum longus, and the flexor hallucis longus. Immediately below the popliteal line is the nutrient foramen, which is large and directed obliquely downward. The lower extremity. The lower extremity is much smaller than the upper, presents five surfaces, it is prolonged downward on the medial side as a strong process, the medial malleolus. Surfaces. The inferior articular surface is quadrilateral and smooth for articulation with the talus. It is concave from before backward, broader in front than behind, and traversed from before backward by a slight elevation separating two depressions. It is continuous with that on the medial malleolus. The anterior surface of the lower extremity is smooth and rounded above, and covered by the tendons of the extensor muscles. Its lower margin presents a rough transverse depression for the attachment of the articular capsule of the ankle joint. The posterior surface is traversed by a shallow groove directed obliquely downward and medialward continuous with a similar groove on the posterior surface of the talus, and serving for the passage of the tendon of the flexor hallucis longus. The lateral surface presents a triangular rough depression for the attachment of the inferior interosseous ligament connecting it with the fibula. The lower part of this depression is smooth, covered with cartilage in the fresh state, and articulates with the fibula. The surface is bounded by two prominent borders continuous above with the interosseous crest, they afford attachment to the anterior and posterior ligaments of the lateral malleolus. The medial surface is prolonged downward to form a strong pyramidal process, flattened from without inward, the medial malleolus. The medial surface of this process is convex and subcutaneous. Its lateral or articular surface is smooth and slightly concave, and articulates with the talus. Its anterior border is rough for the attachment of the anterior fibers of the deltoid ligament of the ankle joint. Its posterior border presents a broad groove, the malleolar sulcus, directed obliquely downward and medialward, and occasionally double. This sulcus lodges the tendons of the tibialis posterior and flexor digitorum longus. The summit of the medial malleolus is marked by a rough depression behind for the attachment of the deltoid ligament. Structure The structure of the tibia is like that of the other long bones. The compact wall of the body is thickest at the junction of the middle and lower thirds of the bone. Ossification The tibia is ossified from three centers, one for the body and one for either extremity. Ossification begins in the center of the body about the seventh week of fetal life and gradually extends towards the extremities. The center for the upper epiphysis appears before or shortly after birth. It is flattened in form and has a thin tongue-shaped process in front which forms the tuberosity. That for the lower epiphysis appears in the second year. The lower epiphysis joins the body at about the 18th and the upper one joins about the twentieth year. Two additional centers occasionally exist, one for the tongue-shaped process of the upper epiphysis which forms the tuberosity, and one for the medial malleolus. End of section 47.
Section 48 of Gray's Anatomy, Part 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leanne Howlett. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 1 by Henry Gray. The Fibula. 6C, Part 6, The Fibula. Calf Bone. The fibula is placed on the lateral side of the tibia, with which it is connected above and below. It is the smaller of the two bones, and in proportion to its length, the most slender of all the long bones. Its upper extremity is small, placed toward the back of the head of the tibia, below the level of the knee joint, and excluded from the formation of this joint. Its lower extremity inclines a little forward, so as to be on a plane anterior to that of the upper end. It projects below the tibia and forms the lateral part of the ankle joint. The bone has a body and two extremities. The upper extremity or head, capitulum fibulae, proximal extremity. The upper extremity is of an irregular quadrate form, presenting above a flattened articular surface directed upward, forward, and medial ward for articulation with a corresponding surface on the lateral condyle of the tibia. On the lateral side is the thick and rough prominence continued behind into a pointed eminence, the apex, styloid process, which projects upward from the posterior part of the head. The prominence at its upper and lateral part gives attachment to the tendon of the biceps femoris and to the fibular collateral ligament of the knee joint, the ligament dividing the tendon into two parts. The remaining part of the circumference of the head is rough for the attachment of muscles and ligaments. It presents in front a tubercle for the origin of the upper and anterior fibers of the peroneus longus and a surface for the attachment of the anterior ligament of the head, and behind another tubercle for the attachment of the posterior ligament of the head and the origin of the upper fibers of the soleus. The body or shaft, corpus fibulae. The body presents four borders, the anterolateral, the anteromedial, the posterolateral, and the posteromedial, and four surfaces, anterior, posterior, medial, and lateral. Borders. The anterolateral border begins above in front of the head, runs vertically downward to a little below the middle of the bone, and then curving somewhat lateralward, bifurcates so as to embrace a triangular subcutaneous surface immediately above the lateral malleolus. This border gives attachment to an intermuscular septum which separates the extensor muscles on the anterior surface of the leg from the peroneae longus and brevis on the lateral surface. The anteromedial border, or interosseous crest, is situated close to the medial side of the preceding and runs nearly parallel with it in the upper third of its extent, but diverges from it in the lower two-thirds. It begins above just beneath the head of the bone. Sometimes it is quite indistinct for about 2.5 centimeters below the head and ends at the apex of a rough triangular surface immediately above the articular facet of the lateral malleolus. It serves for the attachment of the interosseous membrane which separates the extensor muscles in front from the flexor muscles behind. The posterolateral border is prominent. It begins above at the apex and ends below in the posterior border of the lateral malleolus. It is directed lateralward above, backward in the middle of its course, backward and a little medial ward below, and gives attachment to an aponeurosis which separates the peroneae on the lateral surface from the flexor muscles on the posterior surface. The posteromedial border, sometimes called the oblique line, begins above at the medial side of the head and ends by becoming continuous with the interosseous crest at the lower fourth of the bone. It is well marked and prominent at the upper and middle parts of the bone. It gives attachment to an aponeurosis, which separates the tibialis posterior from the soleus and flexor hallucis longus. Surfaces. The anterior surface is the interval between the anterolateral and anteromedial borders. 
It is extremely narrow and flat in the upper third of its extent. Broader and grooved longitudinally in its lower third, it serves for the origin of three muscles, the extensor digitorum longus, extensor hallucis longus, and peroneus tertius. The posterior surface is the space included below the postural lateral and the posteromedial borders. It is continuous below with the triangular area above the articular surface of the lateral malleolus. It is directed backward above, backward and medial ward at its middle, directly medial ward below. Its upper third is rough for the origin of the soleus. Its lower part presents a triangular surface connected to the tibia by a strong interosseous ligament. The intervening part of the surface is covered by the fibers of origin of the flexor hallucis longus. Near the middle of this surface is the nutrient foramen, which is directed downward. The medial surface is the interval included between the anteromedial and the posteromedial borders. It is grooved for the origin of the tibialis posterior. The lateral surface is the space between the anterolateral and posterolateral borders. It is broad and often deeply grooved. It is directed lateral ward in the upper two-thirds of its course, backward in the lower third, where it is continuous with the posterior border of the lateral malleolus. This surface gives origin to the peroneae longus and brevis. The lower extremity or lateral malleolus, malleolus lateralis, distal extremity, external malleolus. The lower extremity is of a pyramidal form and somewhat flattened from side to side. It descends to a lower level than the medial malleolus. The lateral surface is convex, subcutaneous, and continuous with the triangular, subcutaneous surface on the lateral side of the body. The medial surface presents in front a smooth triangular surface, convex from above downward, which articulates with a corresponding surface on the lateral side of the talus. Behind and beneath the articular surface is a rough depression, which gives attachment to the posterior talofibular ligament. The anterior border is thick and rough and marked below by a depression for the attachment of the anterior talofibular ligament. The posterior border is broad and presents the shallow malleolar sulcus for the passage of the tendons of the perioni longus and brevis. The summit is rounded and give attachment to the clacaniofibular ligament. Ossification. The fibula is ossified from three centers one for the body and one for either end. Ossification begins in the body about the eighth week of fetal life and extends toward the extremities. At birth, the ends are cartilaginous. Ossification commences in the lower end in the second year and in the upper about the fourth year. The lower epiphysis, the first to ossify, unites with the body about the twentieth year. The upper epiphysis joins about the twenty-fifth year. End of section 48. Recording by Leanne Howlett. Gray's Anatomy, Part 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Stearns. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 1 by Henry Gray. Section 49, Tarsus. The skeleton of the foot consists of three parts, the tarsus, the metatarsus, and phalanges. The tarsus. Ossa tarsi. The tarsal bones are seven in number, namely, the cochineus, talsus, cuboid, navicular, and the first, second, and third cuneiforms. The cochineus. Os calcis. The calcaneus is the largest of the tarsal bones. It is situated at the lower and back part of the foot, serving to transmit the weight of the body to the ground, and forming a strong lever for the muscles of the calf. It is irregularly cuboidal in form, having its long axis directed forward and lateralward. It presents, for examination, six surfaces. Surfaces. The superior surface extends behind onto that part of the bone which projects 
backward to form the heel. This varies in length in different individuals, is convex from side to side, concave from before backward, and supports a mass of fat placed in front of the tendo calcaneus. In front of this area is a large, usually somewhat oval-shaped facet, the posterior articular surface, which looks upward and forward. It is convex from behind forward and articulates with the posterior calcaneal facet on the under surface of the talus. It is bounded anteriorly by a deep depression, which is continued backward and medialward in the form of a groove, calcaneal sulcus. In the articulated foot, this sulcus lies below a similar one on the under surface of the talus, and the two form a canal, sinus tarsi, for the lodgment of the interosseous talocalcaneal ligament. In front and to the medial side of this groove is an elongated facet, concave from behind forward, and with its long axis directed forward and lateralward. This facet is frequently divided into two by a notch. Of the two, the posterior and larger is termed the middle articular surface. It is supported on a projecting process of bone, the sustentaculum tali, and articulates in the middle calcaneal facet on the under surface of the talus. The anterior articular surface is placed on the anterior part of the body and articulates with the anterior calcaneal facet on the talus. The upper surface, anterior and lateral to the facets, is rough for the attachment of ligaments and for the origin of the extensor digi digitorum brevis. The inferior or plantar surface is uneven, wider behind than in front and convex from side to side. It is bounded posteriorly by a transverse elevation, the calcaneal tuberosity, which is depressed in the middle and prolonged at either end into a process, the lateral process, small, prominent, and rounded, gives origin to the to part of the abductor digiti quinti, the medial process, broader and larger, gives attachment by its prominent medial margin to the abductor hallucis, and in front of the flexor digitorum brevis and the plantar aponeurosis. The depression behind the processes gives origin to the abductor digiti quinti. The rough surface in front of the processes gives attachment to the long plantar ligament and to the lateral head of the quadratus plantae to a prominent tubercle near the anterior part of the surface as well as to a transverse groove in front of the tubercle, is attached the plantar calcaneocuboid ligament. The lateral surface is broad behind and narrow in front, flat and almost subcutaneous. Near its center is a tubercle for the attachment of the calcaneofibular ligament. At its upper and anterior part, this surface gives attachment to the lateral talocalcaneal ligament, and in front of the tubercle it presents a narrow surface marked by two oblique grooves. The grooves are separated by an elevated ridge or tubercle, the trochlear process, peroneal tubercle, which varies much in size in different bones. The superior groove transmits the tendon of the peroneus brevis, the inferior groove that of the Pyrenees longus. The medial surface is deeply concave. It is directed obliquely downward and forward and serves for the transmission of the plantar vessels and nerves into the sole of the foot. It affords origin to part of the quadratus plantae. At its upper and forepart is a horizontal eminence, the sustenta culum tali, which gives attachment to a slip of the tendon of the tibialis posterior. This eminence is concave above and articulates with the middle calcaneal articular surface of the talus. Below it is grooved for the tendon of the flexor hallucis longus. Its anterior margin gives attachment to the plantar 
calcaneonavicular ligament and its medial to a part of the deltoid ligament of the ankle joint. The anterior or cuboid articular surface is of a somewhat triangular form. It is concave from above downward and lateralward and convex in a direction at right angles to this. Its medial border gives attachment to the plantar calconeonavicular ligament. The posterior surface is prominent, convex, wider below than above, and divisible into three areas. The lowest of these is rough and covered by the fatty and fibrous tissue of the heel. The middle, also rough, gives insertion to the tendo calcaneus and the plantaris, while the highest is smooth and is covered by a bursa, which intervenes between it and the tendo calcaneus. Articulations The calcaneus articulates with two bones, the talus and cuboid. The talus, astragalus, ankle bone. The talus is the second largest of the tarsal bones. It occupies the middle and upper part of the tarsus, supporting the tibia above, resting upon the calcaneus below, articulating on either side with the malleoli, and in front with the navicular. It consists of a body, a neck, and a head. The body, corpus tali. The superior surface of the body presents, behind, a smooth trochlear surface, the trochlea, for articulation with the tibia. The trochlea is broader in front than behind, convex from before backward, slightly concave from side to side. In front it is continuous with the upper surface of the neck of the bone. The inferior surface presents two articular areas, the posterior and middle calcaneal surfaces, separated from one another by a deep groove, the sulcus tali. The groove runs obliquely forward and lateralward, becoming gradually broader and deeper in front. In the articulated foot, it lies above a similar groove upon the upper surface of the calcaneus and forms with it a canal, sinus tarsi, filled up in the fresh state by the interosseous talocalcaneal ligament. The posterior calcaneal articular surface is large and of an oval or oblong form. It articulates with the corresponding facet on the upper surface of the calcaneus. Footnote. Sewell, Journal of Anatomy and Physiology, Volume 38, pointed out that in about 10% of bones, a small triangular facet, continuous with the posterior calcaneal facet, is present at the junction of the lateral surface of the body with the posterior wall of the sulcus tali. End footnote and is deeply concave in the direction of its long axis, which runs forward and lateralward at an angle of about 45 degrees with the median plane of the body. The middle calcaneal articular surface is small, oval in form and slightly convex. It articulates with the upper surface of the substanticulum tali of the calcaneus. The medial surface presents at its upper part a pear-shaped articular facet for the medial malleolus, continuous above with the trochlea. Below the articular surface is a rough depression for the attachment of the deep portion of the deltoid ligament of, of the ankle joint. The lateral surface carries a large triangular facet, concave from above downward, for articulation with the lateral malleolus, its anterior half is continuous above with the trochlea, and in front of it is a rough depression for the attachment of the anterior talofibular ligament between the posterior half of the lateral border of the trochlea and the posterior part of the base of the fibular articular surface is a triangular facet which comes into contact with the transverse inferior tibiofibular ligament during flexion of the ankle joint. Below the base of this facet is a groove which affords attachment to the posterior talofibular ligament. The posterior surface is narrow and transverse by a groove running obliquely downward and medialward and transmitting the tendon of the flexor 
Callusus longus. Lateral to the groove is a prominent tubercle, the posterior process, to which the posterior talofibular ligament is attached. This process is sometimes separated from the rest of the talus and is then known as the os trigonum. Medial to the groove is a second smaller tubercle. The neck, column tally. The neck is directed forward and medialward, and comprises the constricted portion of the bone between the body and the oval head. Its upper and medial surfaces are rough for the attachments of ligaments. Its lateral surface is concave and is continuous below with a deep groove for the interosseous talocalcaneal ligament. The head, caput tally. The head looks forward and medialward. Its anterior articular or navicular surface is large, oval, and convex. Its inferior surface has two facets, which are best seen in the fresh condition. The medial, situated in front of the middle calcaneal facet, is convex, triangular, or semi-oval in shape, and rests on the plantar calconeo navicular ligament. The lateral, named the anterior calcaneal articular surface, is somewhat flattened and articulates with a facet on the upper surface of the anterior part of the calcaneus. Articulations The talus articulates with four bones, tibia, fibula, calcaneus, and navicular. The cuboid bone, os cuboidium. The cuboid bone is placed on the lateral side of the foot, in front of the calcaneus, and behind the fourth and fifth metatarsal bones. It is of a pyramidal shape, its base being directed medialward. Surfaces The dorsal surface, directed upward and lateralward, is rough for the attachment of ligaments. The plantar surface presents in front a deep groove the perineal sulcus, which runs obliquely forward and medialward. It lodges the tendon of the perineus longus and is bounded behind by a prominent ridge, to which the long plantar ligament is attached. The ridge ends laterally in an eminence, the tuberosity, the surface of which presents an oval facet. On this facet glides sesamoid bone or cartilage frequently found in the tendon of the perineus longus. The surface of bone behind the groove is rough. For the attachment of the plantar calcaneocuboid ligament, a few fibers of the flexor hallucis brevis and a fasciculus from the tendon of the tibia, tibialis posterior. The lateral surface presents a deep notch formed by the commencement of the perineal sulcus. The posterior surface is smooth triangular, and concavo-convex. For articulation with the anterior surface of the calcaneus, its inferomedial angle projects backward as a process which underlies and supports the anterior end of the calcaneus. The anterior surface, of smaller size, but also irregularly triangular, is divided by a vertical ridge into two facets, the medial quadrilateral in form, articulates with the fourth metatarsal, the lateral, larger and more triangular, articulates with the fifth. The medial surface is broad, irregularly quadrilateral, and presents at its middle and upper part a smooth oval facet, for articulation with a third cuneiform, and behind this, occasionally, a smaller facet, for articulation with a navicular. It is rough in the rest of, of its extent for the attachment of strong interosseous ligaments. Articulations The cuboid articulates with four bones, the calcaneus, third cuneiform, and fourth and fifth metatarsals, occasionally with a fifth, the navicular. The navicular bone, os naviculare pedis, scaphoid bone. The navicular bone is situated at the medial site of the tarsus, between the talus, behind, and the cuneiform bones in front. Surfaces. The
The anterior surface is convex from side to side and subdivided by two ridges into three facets for articulation with the three cuneiform bones. The posterior surface is oval, concave, broader laterally than medially, and articulates with the rounded head of the talus. The dorsal surface is convex from side to side and rough for the attachment of ligaments. The plantar surface is irregular and also rough for the attachment of ligaments. The medial surface presents a rounded tuberosity, the lower part of which gives attachment to part of the tendon of the tibialis posterior. The lateral surface is rough and irregular for the attachment of ligaments and occasionally presents a small facet for articulation with a cuboid bone. Articulations the navicular articulates with four bones, the talus and three cuneiforms, occasionally with a fifth, the cuboid. The first cuneiform bone, os cuneiform primum, internal, internal cuneiform. The first cuneiform bone is the largest of the three cuneiforms. It is situated at the medial side of the foot, between the navicular behind and the base of the first metatarsal in front. Surfaces. The medial surface is subcutaneous, broad and quadrilateral, and its anterior plantar angle is a smooth oval impression, into which part of the tendon of the tibialis anterior is inserted. In the rest of its extent it is rough for the attachment of ligaments. The lateral surface is concave, presenting along its superior and posterior borders a narrow L-shaped surface. The vertical limb and posterior part of the horizontal limb of which articulate with the second cuneiform, or the anterior part of the horizontal limb articulates with the second metatarsal bone. The rest of this surface is rough for the attachment of ligaments and part of the tendon of the perineus longus. The anterior surface, kidney-shaped and much larger than the posterior, articulates with the first metatarsal bone. The posterior surface is triangular, concave, and articulates with the most medial and largest of the three facets of the anterior surface of the navicular. The plantar surface is rough and forms the base of the wedge. At its back part is a tuberosity for the insertion of part of the tendon of the tibialis posterior. It also gives insertion in front to part of the tendon of the tibialis anterior. The dorsal surface is the narrow end of the wedge and is directed upward and lateralward. It is rough for the attachment of ligaments. Articulations. The first cuneiform articulates with four bones, the navicular, second cuneiform, and first and second metatarsals. The second cuneiform bone, os cuneiforme secundum, middle cuneiform. The second cuneiform bone is smallest of the three, is of very regular wedge-like form, the thin end being directed downward. It is situated between the other two cuneiforms and articulates with the navicular behind and the second metatarsal in front. Surfaces. The anterior surface, triangular in form and narrower than the posterior, articulates with the base of the second metatarsal bone. The posterior surface, also triangular, articulates with the intermediate facet on the anterior surface of the navicular. The medial surface carries an L-shaped articular facet running along the superior and posterior borders for articulation with the first cuneiform and is rough in the rest of its extent for the attachment of ligaments. The lateral surface presents a posteriorly a smooth facet for articulation with a third cuneiform bone. The dorsal surface forms the base of the wedge. It is quadrilateral and rough for the attachment of ligaments. The plantar surface, sharp and tuberculated, is also rough for the attachment of ligaments and for the insertion of a slip from the tendon of the tibialis posterior. Articulations. The second cuneiform articulates with four bones, the navicular, first and third cuneiforms, and second metatarsal. The third cuneiform bone, os cuneiforme tertium, external cuneiform. 
The third cuneiform bone, intermediate in size between the two preceding, is wedge-shaped, the base being uppermost. It occupies the center of the front row of the tarsal bones, between the second cuneiform medially and cuboid laterally, the navicular behind, and the third metatarsal in front. Surfaces The anterior surface, triangular in form, articulates with the third metatarsal bone. The posterior surface articulates with a lateral facet on the anterior surface of the navicular, and is rough below for the attachment of ligamentous fibers. The medial surface presents an anterior and posterior articular facet. Separated by a rough depression, the anterior, sometimes divided, articulates with the lateral side of the base of the second metatarsal bone. The posterior skirts the posterior border and articulates with the second cuneiform. The rough depression gives attachment to an interosseo ligament. The lateral surface also presents two articular facets separated by a rough non-articular area, the anterior facet. Situated at the superior angle of the bone, is small and semi-oval in shape and articulates with the medial side of the base of the fourth metatarsal bone. The posterior and larger one is triangular or oval and articulates with the cuboid. The rough non-articular area serves for the attachment of the interosseous ligament. The three facets for articulation with the three metatarsal bones are continuous with one another. Those for articulation with the second cuneiform and navicular are also continuous, but that for articulation with a cuboid is usually separate. The dorsal surface is of an oblong form, its posterior lateral angle being prolonged backward. The plantar surface is a rounded margin and serves for the attachment of part of the tendon of the tibialis posterior, part of the flexor hallucis brevis, and ligaments. Articulations. The third cuneiform articulates with six bones, the navicular, the second cuneiform, cuboid, and second, third, and fourth metatarsals. End of section 49. Recording by Jennifer Stearns, Concord, New Hampshire. Of Gray's Anatomy, Part 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Laurie Ann Walden. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 1, by Henry Gray. The Metatarsus. The Metatarsus consists of five bones which are numbered from the medial side, Ossa Metatarsalia, 1 through 5. Each presents for examination a body and two extremities. Common Characteristics of the Metatarsal Bones The body is prismoid in form, tapers gradually from the tarsal to the phalangeal extremity, and is curved longitudinally, so as to be concave below, slightly convex above. The base, or posterior extremity, is wedge-shaped, articulating proximally with the tarsal bones, and by its sides with the contiguous metatarsal bones. Its dorsal and plantar surfaces are rough for the attachments of ligaments. The head, or anterior extremity, presents a convex articular surface, oblong from above downward, and extending farther backward below than above. Its sides are flattened, and on each is a depression, surmounted by a tubercle, for ligamentous attachment. Its plantar surface is grooved anteroposteriorly for the passage of the flexor tendons, and marked on either side by an articular eminence, continuous with the terminal articular surface. Characteristics of the individual metatarsal bones. The first metatarsal bone. Os metatarsali, one. Metatarsal bone of the great toe. The first metatarsal bone is remarkable for its great thickness, and is the shortest of the metatarsal bones. The body is strong and of well-marked prismoid form. The base presents, as a rule, no articular facets on its sides, but occasionally, on the lateral side, there is an oval facet by which it articulates with the second metatarsal. 
Its proximal articular surface is of large size and kidney-shaped. Its circumference is grooved for the tarso-metatarsal ligaments, and medially gives insertion to part of the tendon of the tibialis anterior. Its plantar angle presents a rough oval prominence for the insertion of the tendon of the perineus longus. The head is large. On its plantar surface are two grooved facets on which glide sesamoid bones. The facets are separated by a smooth elevation. The second metatarsal bone, os metatarsali, two. The second metatarsal bone is the longest of the metatarsal bones, being prolonged backward into the recess formed by the three cuneiform bones. Its base is broad above, narrow and rough below. It presents four articular surfaces, one behind of a triangular form for articulation with the second cuneiform, one at the upper part of its medial surface for articulation with the first cuneiform, and two on its lateral surface, an upper and lower, separated by a rough non-articular interval. Each of these lateral articular surfaces is divided into two by a vertical ridge. The two anterior facets articulate with the third metatarsal, the two posterior, sometimes continuous, with the third cuneiform. A fifth facet is occasionally present for articulation with the first metatarsal. It is oval in shape and is situated on the medial side of the body, near the base. The third metatarsal bone, os metatarsali three. The third metatarsal bone articulates proximally, by means of a triangular smooth surface, with the third cuneiform, medially by two facets, with the second metatarsal, and laterally by a single facet, with the fourth metatarsal. This last facet is situated at the dorsal angle of the base. The fourth metatarsal bone, os metatarsali, four. The fourth metatarsal bone is smaller in size than the preceding. Its base presents an oblique quadrilateral surface for articulation with the cuboid, a smooth facet on the medial side, divided by a ridge into an anterior portion for articulation with the third metatarsal and a posterior portion for articulation with the third cuneiform. On the lateral side, a single facet for articulation with the fifth metatarsal. The fifth metatarsal bone, os metatarsali, five. The fifth metatarsal bone is recognized by a rough eminence, the tuberosity, on the lateral side of its base. The base articulates behind by a triangular surface cut obliquely in a transverse direction, with the cuboid, and medially with the fourth metatarsal. On the medial part of its dorsal surface is inserted the tendon of the perineus tertius, and on the dorsal surface of the tuberosity, that of the perineus brevis. A strong band of the plantar aponeurosis connects the projecting part of the tuberosity with the lateral process of the tuberosity of the calcaneus. The plantar surface of the base is grooved for the tendon of the abductor digiti quinti, and gives origin to the flexor digiti quinti brevis. Articulations The base of each metatarsal bone articulates with one or more of the tarsal bones, and the head with one of the first row of phalanges. The first metatarsal articulates with the first cuneiform, the second with all three cuneiforms, the third with the third cuneiform, the fourth with the third cuneiform and the cuboid, and the fifth with the cuboid. The Phalanges of the Foot, Phalanges Digitorum Pettis. The phalanges of the foot correspond, in number and general arrangement, with those of the hand. There are two in the great toe, and three in each of the other toes. They differ from them, however, in their size, the bodies being much reduced in length, and, especially in the first row, laterally compressed. First row. The body of each is compressed from side to side, convex above, concave below. The base is concave, and the head presents a trochlear surface for articulation with the second phalanx. Second row. The phalanges of the second row are remarkably small and short, but rather broader than those of the first row. The ungual phalanges, in form, resemble those of the fingers, but they are smaller and are flattened from above downward. Each presents a broad base for articulation with the corresponding bone of the second row, and an expanded distal extremity for the support of the nail and end of the toe. Articulations 
In the second, third, fourth, and fifth toes, the phalanges of the first row articulate behind with the metatarsal bones, and in front with the second phalanges, which, in their turn, articulate with the first and third. The ungual phalanges articulate with the second. Ossification of the bones of the foot. The tarsal bones are each ossified from a single center, excepting the calcaneus, which has an epiphysis for its posterior extremity. The centers make their appearance in the following order. Calcaneus at the sixth month of fetal life. Talus about the seventh month. Cuboid at the ninth month. Third cuneiform during the first year. First cuneiform in the third year. Second cuneiform and navicular in the fourth year. The epiphysis for the posterior extremity of the calcaneus appears at the tenth year and unites with the rest of the bone soon after puberty. The posterior process of the talus is sometimes ossified from a separate center and may remain distinct from the main mass of the bone when it is named the os trigonum. The metatarsal bones are each ossified from two centers, one for the body and one for the head of the second, third, fourth, and fifth metatarsals one for the body and one for the base, of the first metatarsal. Footnote. As was noted in the first metacarpal, so in the first metatarsal there is often a second epiphysis for its head. End footnote. Ossification commences in the center of the body about the ninth week, and extends toward either extremity. The center for the base of the first metatarsal appears about the third year. The centers for the heads of the other bones between the fifth and eighth years. They join the bodies between the eighteenth and twentieth years. The phalanges are each ossified from two centers, one for the body and one for the base. The center for the body appears about the tenth week, that for the base between the fourth and tenth years. It joins the body about the eighteenth year. End of section 50one of Gray's Anatomy Part 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Laurie Ann Walden. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 1, by Henry Gray. Section 51. Comparison of the Bones of the Hand and Foot. The hand and foot are constructed on somewhat similar principles, each consisting of a proximal part, the carpus or the tarsus, a middle portion, the metacarpus or the metatarsus, and a terminal portion, the phalanges. The proximal part consists of a series of more or less cubical bones, which allow a slight amount of gliding on one another, and are chiefly concerned in distributing forces transmitted to or from the bones of the arm or leg. The middle part is made up of slightly movable long bones, which assist the carpus or tarsus in distributing forces, and also give greater breadth for the reception of such forces. The separation of the individual bones from one another allows of the attachments of the interossei, and protects the dorsi palmar and dorsi plantar vascular anastomoses. The terminal portion is the most movable, and its separate elements enjoy a varied range of movements, the chief of which are flexion and extension. The function of the hand and foot are, however, very different, and the general similarity between them is greatly modified to meet these requirements. Thus the foot forms a firm basis of support for the body in the erect posture, and is therefore more solidly built up, and its component parts are less movable on each other than those of the hand. In the case of the phalanges the difference is readily noticeable. Those of the foot are smaller, and their movements are more limited than those of the hand. Very much more marked is the difference between the metacarpal bone of the thumb and the metatarsal bone of the great toe. The metacarpal bone of the thumb is constructed to permit of great mobility, is directed at an acute angle from that of the index finger, and is capable of a considerable range of movements at its articulation with the carpus. The metatarsal bone of the great toe assists in supporting the weight of the body, is constructed with great solidity lies parallel with the other metatarsals, and has a very limited degree of mobility. The carpus is small in proportion to the rest of the hand, is placed in a line with the forearm, and forms a transverse arch, the concavity of which constitutes a bed for the flexor tendons and the palmar vessels and nerves. 
The tarsus forms a considerable part of the foot, and is placed at right angles to the leg, a position which is almost peculiar to man, and has relation to his erect posture. In order to allow of their supporting the weight of the body with the least expenditure of material, the tarsus and a part of the metatarsus are constructed in a series of arches, the disposition of which will be considered after the articulations of the foot have been described. The sesamoid bones, ossa sesamoidea. Sesamoid bones are small, more or less rounded masses, embedded in certain tendons, and usually related to joint surfaces. Their functions probably are to modify pressure, to diminish friction, and occasionally to alter the direction of a muscle pull. That they are not developed to meet certain physical requirements in the adult is evidenced by the fact that they are present as cartilaginous nodules in the fetus, and in greater numbers than in the adult. They must be regarded, according to Thelanius, as integral parts of the skeleton phylogenetically inherited. Physical necessities probably come into play in selecting and in regulating the degree of development of the original cartilaginous nodules. Nevertheless, irregular nodules of bone may appear as the result of intermittent pressure in certain regions, for example, the rider's bone, which is occasionally developed in the adductor muscles of the thigh. Sesamoid bones are invested by the fibrous tissue of the tendons, except on the surfaces in contact with the parts over which they glide, where they present smooth articular facets. In the upper extremity, the sesamoid bones of the joints are found only on the palmar surface of the hand. Two, of which the medial is the larger, are constant at the metacarpophalangeal joint of the thumb. One is frequently present in the corresponding joint of the little finger, and one or two in the same joint of the index finger. Sesamoid bones are also found occasionally at the metacarpophalangeal joints of the middle and ring fingers, at the interphalangeal joint of the thumb, and at the distal interphalangeal joint of the index finger. In the lower extremity, the largest sesamoid bone of the joints is the patella, developed in the tendon of the quadriceps femoris. On the plantar aspect of the foot, two, of which the medial is the larger, are always present at the metatarsophalangeal joint of the great toe, one sometimes at the metatarsophalangeal joints of the second and fifth toes, one occasionally at the corresponding joint of the third and fourth toes, and one at the interphalangeal joint of the great toe. Sesamoid bones apart from joints are seldom found in the tendons of the upper limb. One is sometimes seen in the tendon of the biceps brachii opposite the radial tuberosity. They are, however, present in several of the tendons of the lower limb. For example, one in the tendon of the perineus longus, where it glides on the cuboid, one appearing late in life in the tendon of the tibialis anterior, opposite the smooth facet of the first cuneiform bone, one in the tendon of the tibialis posterior, opposite the medial side of the head of the talus, one in the lateral head of the gastrocnemius, behind the lateral condyle of the femur, and one in the tendon of the psoas major, where it glides over the pubis. Sesamoid bones are found occasionally in the tendon of the gluteus maximus, as it passes over the greater trochanter, and in the tendons which wind around the medial and lateral malleoli. End of section 51. End of Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 1, by Henry Gray.